Okay, we have a, uh, we hope, very interesting couple of days li lined up for you. We've been planning this event for a while. Um, let me give you just some logistic information. One, we do have internet access in this room. It is open. You should be able to get onto it if you want without a password. The restrooms are just outside this door in the alcove, just to the way. If you haven't had, uh, we do have breakfast available for you if you needed to catch it, and, some, and we'll have drinks uh, over on the side um, throughout the day. We will have some birds of a feather sessions this afternoon. We intended from the beginning that this event would be highly interactive. So you will have lots of opportunities to discuss these issues um, that you'll hear about with your colleagues, the other people attending, and, uh, and also lots of opportunities to network during this event. On the birds of a feather sessions, um, they'll be held in this room at the tables, and we have sign-up sheets out there so you can regroup in different topical clusters. So if you would like to propose a topic, the, the sheets are out there on that big central round table, um, and during the break you can go out there and either sign up for one or propose one, form a new group. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to that in the afternoon. Okay, now we are going to uh, go to our, our keynote speaker and to introduce her, Dr. Spencer Corrales will come up. So before I introduce the keynote, I want to mention that we have, do have someone coming to lower the blinds on the upper deck. Um, so I noticed some folks are putting on sunglasses. Um, uh, and uh, I also wanted to mention that if you do, if you are on Twitter, we do welcome you to um, interlocute with our speakers and the, the program today. Um, the, so, to the Twitter handle for the uh, event is OA Symposium, um, and the ha official hashtag is um, OA13UNT. Uh, when I was at uh, doing grad school at NYU, um, which is also, I believe, the, uh, the uh, alma mater of our keynote speaker, um, one of the things we were taught is that all scholarship in the humanities is essentially a version of parasite. Um, we're supposed to set out to um, massacre those that came before us and stake out new ground for ourselves. Um, so we're not really allowed to have many heroes. Um, uh, but it is my pleasure today to introduce someone who has, over the past few years, become a hero of mine uh, because of her intervention in the field of, that we share. Um, Dr. Kathleen Fitzpatrick is the Director of Scholarly Communications um, at the Modern Language Association, and she's also on leave from a position as Professor of Media Studies at Pomona College in Claremont, California. Uh, her first book, which was innovative in and of itself, uh, published in 2006 by Vanderbilt University Press, is The Anxiety of Obsolescence, the American Novel in the Age of Television. Uh, in that book, she traces the ways in which the myth that television killed the audience for serious literature was, in fact, propagated by a small cadre of writers of serious literature in order to set themselves up as the last bastions of good writing. Um, in 2009, she embarked on an experiment to push the bounds of academic publishing, releasing the draft of her second book online for open peer review. Um, the resulting book, Planned Obsolescence, Publishing Technology and the Future of the Academy, was published by NYU Press in November of 2011. Planned obsolescence reads like a manifesto, challenging us to rethink the crises of the 21st century academy in more communally oriented ways and to address the social and institutional origins of these crises. Planned obsolescence should be required reading for everyone, students and staff, faculty and administrators, with a stake in remaking the academy for a more sustainable and meaningful future. She's also the co-founder of Media Commons, a digital scholarly network uh, promoting uh, exploration of new forms of publishing within the field of media studies. In her role as scholarly communications director for the MLA, Kathleen has been a driver for change within that scholarly community, advocating tirelessly for the recognition of alt act careers and promoting the construct constructive evaluation of the interdisciplinary digital products of humanities research. Kathleen is a visionary and a leader um, who's willing to reach out across um, disciplinary boundaries um, while, uh, to encourage um, the collaboration while still acknowledging the value of deep disciplinary knowledge from all parties, uh, including librarians. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome her today. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Spencer. That's awfully nice and a whole lot to live up to. So um, 
I, I'm really thrilled to be here today. Um, as, as Spencer has just told you, I am the director of scholarly communication at the Modern Language Association now. Um, and the MLA, as, as most of you know, is the largest US scholarly society in the humanities. And as you might expect, um, the MLA is popularly seen as a pretty conservative organization. Um, and you know, insofar as that's true, it's for pretty good reasons. Um, the association's mandate over the last 130 years has included furthering the values of careful, deliberative scholarly thought in a culture that often seems to prize speed and under-considered notions of progress above all else. Now, on the other hand, though, as Abby Clowbridge recently noted in her review of the National Academy of Sciences public comment meeting on public access to federally funded research, the Modern Language Association was the lone publisher to offer full support for a new model for scholarly communication. Now, the question is, of course, how we at the MLA came to this position and how are we working strategically to imagine the future of our publishing and communication activities? I'm, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to share with you today some of our thinking, or at least some of my thinking, um, behind these issues. Um, I should warn you that there is a whole lot of preaching to the choir in what follows, um, as well as a recap of some history and some definitions that I'm, I know you are all perfectly well aware of. Um, but I hope you'll bear with me and that all of that background material pays off in the end. Um, since the founding of the Royal Society of London, um, learned and professional societies have been created precisely in order to help facilitate communication amongst member scholars and between those members and the broader intellectual world. Now, early on, that communication took place through meetings and through letters that were sent among the members between meetings. And over time, the meetings developed into regularly scheduled conferences, and the letters were gathered into systematically produced and distributed journals. These journals accrued a series of formal publishing processes, including editing and peer review, that came to mark them as authoritative source or resources for developing knowledge in their fields. And those resources came to be valued not only by their original audience, the members of the society, but also by a broader range of scholars, researchers, and students. And as a result, research libraries collected these journals and made them available to their patrons. Now, this was a system that worked, by and large. Scholars joined societies in order to gain access to the resources and the conversations that those societies made available. Societies were supported in their work, not only by those members, but also by libraries, whose subscriptions extended the reach of those resources. And the funds generated through membership dues and subscriptions enabled the societies not only to fulfill their mission of facilitating scholarly communication, but also to do other kinds of work on behalf of their members, including advocating for their fields within institutions and on the national and international scene, supporting members in developing their professional practices and standards, and so on. Right? So joining a society was what professionals did, and scholarly communication was what scholarly societies were for. Now, things have changed over the last several decades, however, and the development of new technologies for communication is only one of those changes. Um, scholars' professional lives have become increasingly precarious as employment conditions in colleges and universities have dramatically weakened. As a result, an increasing number of scholars are unable or unwilling to commit the ongoing resources to professional societies that they feel cannot adequately assist in meeting their core needs. University and, library, or, and research libraries' budgets have been strained by the need to maintain often exorbitant subscriptions to journals sold by commercial publishers. And as a result, those libraries are decreasingly willing and able to help support the not-for-profit societies to which scholars at their institutions belong. Societies find themselves straining under declining membership fees, increasing publishing costs, and diminishing subscription revenue. And as a result, many societies have turned to commercial publishers as a means of sustaining their communication programs and supporting their other functions. But those publishers, of course, have a very different sense of mission from the scholars, libraries, and societies among which they mediate. 
So into this already complex set of competing interests and needs enter the internet, and in particular the World Wide Web. The web was, like scholarly societies, invented for the express purpose of supporting communication amongst researchers by allowing them to create pages on which they can share their work with one another and with the world. The difference, of course, is that the web permits any individual scholar with server access and a little bit of technical knowledge, that's exciting, <laughs> a little bit of technical knowledge to share their work directly and immediately, further diminishing their apparent need for those collectives that scholarly societies have historically provided. As a result of those tensions, recent discussions about open access have been beset by a series of misunderstandings and miscommunications, some of them I think intentional, um, though some unintentional as well. Many scholars, for instance, fear that open access will result in a chaos of self-publishing without any peer review, despite the fact that open access publishing is perfectly well compatible with peer review, and in fact that new modes of review for openly published work are being developed. Many, society, uh, many societies argue that open access is financially unsustainable and that it will destroy the business models on which they have relied, when in fact a, a series of new models for open access publishing are coming into being, not to mention of course the fact that several commercial publishers have recently announced new OA ventures, which they certainly would not have done if they hadn't found a profit model in it somewhere. On the other hand, many people believe that open access publishing can be done for free, right? While it's true that the costs of reproduction for scholarship online trend toward zero, significant costs of production remain, costs that are too often covered through a reliance on volunteer or undercompensated labor undertaken by members of the scholarly community, such as graduate students, for whom the promise of future professional reward is often the most distant and the most illusory. So as a result, arguments around open access tend to wind up in a kind of stalemate, um, with various constituencies um, involved talking past one another rather than with one another. Um, we at the MLA strongly believe that this need not be so. Um, we all of us, scholars, libraries, societies, and the broader public, share the goal of increasing the wealth of knowledge that we hold in common. And if we focus on that collective goal, a viable path forward can be carved out. In order to find that path, however, we need to shift our thinking about open access from a focus on costs to a focus on values. Though, of course, without entirely leaving behind the overwhelming and at times quite grim economic realities by which we're surrounded. Now, the focus on costs to the exclusion of all else, has of course produced a painful linkage between scholarly communication and the market forces that have long governed its channels. Um, this linkage, as the Association of Research Libraries has suggested, must be broken in order for scholarship to do the work for which it's intended. Um, in the interests of science, an ARL report on the beginnings of the open access movement argued, the law of the market cannot be allowed to function. An item with a very small market may yet be the indispensable link in a chain of research that leads to a result of high social value. Now, this is, of course, um, the problem of the long tail in scholarly publishing. In traditional publishing, a few bestsellers provide financial support for the much less popular items on the list, those items down the tail that are extremely important to someone but are unlikely to reach a terribly large audience. Now the problem for us is that scholarly publications are all tail. Right? Practically the only audience for the vast majority of the stuff at least is the same group of scholars who are producing it. And yet for those scholars the work is indispensable. Right? The open access movement was founded as a means of attempting to ensure that the social value that's provided by scholarly research could flourish. Um, the guiding principles of this movement were, of course, originally articulated in the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which was published in 2002, which gave the movement its name. Following behind the Budapest Initiative were the June 2003 Bethesda Statement on Open Access Publishing and the October 2003 Berlin Declaration on Open Access to Scientific Knowledge. 
Together, Budapest, Bethesda, Berlin defined the agenda for open access scholarly publishing. By open access to this literature, the Budapest Initiative reads, um, we mean its free availability on the public internet, permitting any users to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search, or link to the full text of these articles, crawl them for indexing, pass them as data to software, or use them for any other lawful purpose without financial, legal, or technical barriers other than those inseparable from gaining access to the internet itself. The only constraint on reproduction and distribution and the only role for copyright in this domain should be to give authors control over the integrity of their work and the right to be properly acknowledged and cited. Open access, that is, means free access, not just in the sense of gratis, right, work that's avail made available without charge, but also in the sense of libre work that, subject to appropriate standards of scholarly citation, is free to be built upon. Now this is the cornerstone of the scholarly project. Scholarship is written to be read and to influence more new writing. So early mobilization around open access thus focused not just on the economic inequities that were being worsened by the market orientation of scholarly publishers, but on the resulting restrictions in the creation of new knowledge that were being created by the growing divide between information haves and have-nots. Open access provided the potential for scholars to help bridge this divide, serving not only their own interests in getting their work into broader circulation, but also serving a larger public interest. As the Budapest Open Access Initiative put it, an old tradition and a new technology have converged to make possible an unprecedented public good. The old tradition is the willingness of scientists and scholars to publish the fruits of their research in scholarly journals without payment for the sake of inquiry and knowledge. The new technology is the internet. The public good they make possible is the worldwide electronic distribution of the peer-reviewed journal literature and completely free and unrestricted access to it by all scientists, scholars, teachers, students, and other curious minds. Removing access barriers to this literature will accelerate research, enrich education, share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, make this literature as useful as it can be, and lay the foundation for uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. Oh. It's hard not to be moved by the idealism of a statement such as this, and easy to see why the movement's impact accelerated from this point forward. The 10th anniversary of the Budapest Open Access Initiative was celebrated last year, and in the intervening decade, the open access movement spread through a dramatic increase in the number of open access journals, right, the so-called gold road to open access. Um, and these, these journals were spread, including the, the very public mass resignations of a number of editorial boards of closed access journals who then joined together to start new publications online. Additionally, the open access movement over the last decade was profoundly expanded through a number of institutional and disciplinary repositories, right, the green road to open access, um, as well as an increasing number of institution and funder-based ba mandates requiring the deposit of products of research done under their auspices. Uh, by November 2011, at Berlin 9, which was the ninth annual conference associated with the Berlin Declaration and the first of those conferences to be held in the U.S., 34 North American signatories had endorsed the Declaration and agreed to uphold its principles, including more than 20 colleges and universities. Now, these signatories had collectively produced a powerful demonstration of the expansion of U.S. commitment to facilitating public, uh, open access, a commitment that can be seen at the national level in the recent White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Directive on public access to the results of federally funded research. Now, though these conversations, um, including the OSTP directive, have to this point been overwhelmingly dominated by the sciences, the humanities are nonetheless involved in these conversations. Um, the National Endowment for the Humanities, for instance, has endorsed the aims of the OSTP directive and is working with other national funding bodies to develop a plan for ensuring that journal articles and data sets that are produced as a result of their grant programs are made as openly available as possible. 
But while humanities fields bear certain kinds of interests in common with the sciences, there are a few important differences as well. Um, the most obvious of these is a radical difference in funding systems and levels. Um, scientific research is all but impossible to conduct without large-scale grant funding, and scientists have long been able to write publishing costs into their grants. As a result, the business model for open access scientific publishing was relatively clear, shift from a reader pays mode to an author pays mode, right? Easy peasy. Um, in the humanities, however, not only is the available funding generally too low to accommodate significant publishing charges to authors, but the vast majority of research is either supported by the scholar's institution or is self-funded. For that reason, among others, I don't want to make it sound as if I'm suggesting that a large-scale transition of humanities publishing to an open access model would be easy. It, it won't be. Um, humanities publishing faces a set of financial constraints that are daunting at the best of times and crushing in times of economic retraction. As I argue, however, in planned obsolescence, I mean, it's perfectly well possible to make scholarly publishing profitable. Right? The Wileys and the Elseviers have certainly managed it, um, though of course they've done so at the direct expense of our universities. For not-for-profit scholarly publishers to follow the commercial publisher's lead in seeking a profit basis for scholarly communication would, for a whole range of reasons that I do explore in the book, be a disaster. I mean, those presses simply cannot be beaten at their own game, as the large conglomerates that operate them will always be able to conduct business more efficiently and more ruthlessly than the university should want to do. But nor can we simply hand over the business of scholarly publishing to them to operate. As John Thompson has noted in Books in the Digital Age, in times of economic slowdown, commercial logic would tend to override any obligation such companies might feel to the scholarly community, leaving nothing for them to, to stop them um, from eliminating academic publishing entirely if it ceases to pay. And it's for this reason that I want to argue that, despite the serious difficulties involved, a transition to thinking about entirely new modes of open access um, scholarly communication is really desirable, and, and in fact desirable enough that rather than ending our conversations, as has happened a lot in recent years, with the seeming insurmountableness of the financial obstacles, um, the humanities publishers must start figuring out what it will take to get around those obstacles. Now, one thing that makes open access publishing so desirable for the future of scholarly communication in the humanities is precisely the increased impact that openly distributed scholarship is able to have. And study after study has shown that open access literature, whether that published in gold OA journals or that deposited in green OA archives, is more cited than is work published in traditional closed venues. And in addition to facilitating traditional researcher access, however, openly published work can, can also reach a much broader range of readers, right? Students and instructors at undergraduate teaching institutions and at secondary schools, for instance, as well as folks who work outside academia entirely. It's, it's not without irony that I note that, that the um, employees of the NEH actually do not have access to a whole lot of the literature that they fund the publication of, right? Um, open access scholarship has the potential to reach a very broad spectrum of potentially interested publics. Now, we in the humanities um, often resist opening our work to those publics, fearing the consequences of such openness. And it, it's not without reason. Um, the world at times fails to understand what it is that we do. And because our subject matter seems as though it's just a, a sort of matter for hobby, hobbyists, right? You're just writing about books or movies or art after all. Um, it seems as though the public isn't inclined to wrestle with the kinds of difficulties that our work presents, right? Their dismissive responses to the work that we do often give us the clear sense that, that they don't take our work as seriously as, say, papers in high-energy physics, um, which few lay readers would assume their ability to comprehend without some background or training. But as a result of these double miscommunications and misunderstandings, we end up closing our work off from the public, um, arguing that we're just writing for a small community of specialists anyhow, in which case, why would open access matter? 
The problem, of course, is that the more that we close our work away from the public and the more we refuse to engage in dialogue across the boundaries of the academy, the more we undermine that public's willingness to fund our research and our institutions. As Kathy Woodward put it in a talk at the 2012 MLA convention, the major crisis facing the funding of higher education is an increasingly widespread conviction that education is a private responsibility rather than a public good. We wind up strength strengthening that conviction when we treat our work as private by keeping it to ourselves. Now, closing our work away from non-scholarly readers and keeping our conversations private might protect us from public criticism, but it can't protect us from public apathy, which is a condition that is in the current economic and political environment far more dangerous. Now, this is not to say that openness doesn't bear risks, particularly for scholars working in controversial areas of research, but it is to say that only through open dialogue across the walls of the ivory tower will we have any chance of convincing the broader public, including our governmental funding bodies, of the importance of our work. And let me say this clearly, increasing the discoverability of scholarly work on the web, making it available to a broader readership is a good thing, right? Not just for the individual scholar, but for the entirety of the field in which she works. The more that well-researched, thoughtful scholarship on contemporary cultural issues is available to, for instance, journalists who are covering those issues for popular venues, the richer the discourse in those publications will become, increasing, not incidentally, the visibility of the institutions of higher education and their importance to the culture at large. Now, even more important, though, than its ability to foster this kind of impact is the fact that open access publishing is far more in keeping with the core values of the scholarly enterprise. And among the values I'd like us to focus on is, is what I've come to think of as the ethics of giving it away. Um, this idea comes to me from David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest and its rendering of the ethos of Alcoholics Anonymous. Bear with me, there is a connection. Um, <laughs> Giving it away is a cardinal Boston AA principle. The terms derived from an epigrammatic description of recovery in Boston AA. You give it up to get it back to give it away. Sobriety in Boston is regarded less as a gift than a sort of cosmic loan. You can't pay the loan back, but you can pay it forward by spreading the message that despite all appearances, AA works. Spreading this message to the next new guy who's tottered into a meeting and is sitting in the back row, unable to hold his cup of coffee. The only way to hang on to sobriety is to give it away. Now this requirement of passing on what has been learned has its origins in the program's 12th step, in which the recovering alcoholic carries the message forward to those who need it. The sharing that this sense of giving it away invokes, right, the loan that can never be paid back but only forward, includes that sharing that's done at meetings, telling one's story, not just as a means of self-expression, but rather as an act of generosity that enables the addict to transcend the self. Giving it away is thus a profoundly ethical mode of engaging with others in need. More than that, in Infinite Jest, giving it away becomes the only means of escaping the self-destructive spiral of addiction and self-absorption that constitutes not an anomalous state, but in fact the central mode of being in the contemporary Western world. Now, what I want to argue is that this sense of giving it away, of paying forward knowledge that one likewise received as a gift, functions well as a description of what should be the best ethical practices of scholars and educators. We teach as we were taught. We publish as we learn from the publications of others. We cannot pay back those who came before us, but can only give to those who come after. Our participation in an ethical, voluntary, scholarly community is grounded in the obligation that we owe one another, an obligation that derives from what we have received. Now, like the stirring sense in the Budapest Open Access Initiative of uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge, um, this sort of idealism is all well and good. Um, but it doesn't adequately account for an academic universe in which we are evaluated based on individual achievement and in which prestige often outstrips all other values. 
Um, surveys that have been conducted both by Ithaca and by the Center for Studies in Higher Education at UC Berkeley indicate that a fundamentally conservative set of faculty attitudes continues to impede systematic change. I mean, scholars choose to publish in those venues that are perceived to have the highest influence on their peers. And that influence is often imagined to increase with exclusivity. The more difficult it is to get an article into a journal, the higher the perceived value of having done so, of course. But this sense of prestige too easily shades over into a sense that the more exclusively a publication is distributed, the higher its value. I mean, if we were simply to give our work away, it seems, its value would quickly trend towards zero. Well, this is, at its most benign, a self-defeating attitude. If we prize exclusivity above all else, we should not be surprised when our work fails to circulate. And, in fact, it is when our work fails to circulate that its value declines. As David Perry has commented, knowledge which is not public is not knowledge. It is only in giving it away that we truly produce knowledge. It is only in escaping our self-absorption as a field, in sharing our ideas with others, that we can pay forward the loan that we have been so generously given. Such an approach to our work, I would argue, requires less of a change than it might initially sound. In fact, all of the players in the scholarly communication chain, um, authors, reviewers, editors, publishers, have always been engaged in a process of giving it away. Right? It's just a matter of how and to whom. Now, the entire enterprise of scholarly communication runs on an engine of generosity. None of our work can ever truly be for our own profit. When we try to profit from it ourselves is precisely when we lose most profoundly. So rather than giving our work away to corporate entities that will profit at our expense, um, might all of the players in the scholarly communication chain, scholars, libraries, and societies, instead find a way to make a virtue of our market failures? I mean, what if we understood sustainability not as the ability to generate revenue, but instead as the ability to keep the engine of generosity running? What if we were to allow the engine of generosity on which so much of the enterprise um, runs to affect the final point of distribution? If we were to embrace the gift economy of scholarly communication and make a gift of our work to others? I mean, what might happen if outreach, generosity, giving it away were among our primary values? Now, I do want, in asking all of these not entirely rhetorical questions, um, to distinguish between, on the one hand, this kind of gift economy that I'm describing and the generous impulses that should underwrite it, and on the other, the injunction to work for free that's been produced by the devaluation of much intellectual and professional labor. This latter mode of forced volunteerism has taken root across the current economy, compelling college students and recent graduates to take on exploitative unpaid internships in order to get a foot in the door, compelling professional web programmers and designers to do free work in order to create a portfolio, and so on. In scholarly communication, the same situation arises when formerly professionalized positions within publishing, such as the managing editor of a journal, are defunded, with the result that the labor devolves onto graduate students and non-tenure track faculty who are compelled to work today for free based upon the promise of some future reward, usually in the shape of a tenure track position, um, resulting from this experience. This is not generosity, this is exploitation. It's not paying forward the benefits of what's one received. It's a high interest student loan. It's for this reason, in part, that I insist that the products of scholarly communication not only cannot be, but should not be produced for free. Where I ask for generosity, it's from those who can afford to be generous, those tenured and tenure track faculty and other fully employed members of the profession who can afford to give away the products of the labor they have already been supported in undertaking, for instance, as well as those institutions that can and should underwrite the production of scholarship on behalf of the academy at large. This is a form of generosity that's not just a nice thing to do. It's a responsibility, a mode of looking outside Side the self to the world beyond, a relation like that of infinite jests recovering addicts who recognize that the only way to hang on to the gifts that they've been given is to pass them on to others. 
Those of us who can afford to support ethical practices in communication must. That means that scholars must commit to making their work as openly and freely available as possible, but also that they should support the organizations that are working to help them do so. It means that libraries should help scholars find the best means of getting their work into open circulation, but also that they should use their circulation budgets to support those nonprofit organizations that are working to develop and promote better scholarly communication practices. And it of course means that publishers, particularly university presses and scholarly societies, must actively seek those better practices, focusing on the public good that is, that is served when scholarship is allowed to circulate as openly as possible. Now again, this is not to suggest that absolutely everything can or should be made available without cost. Um, there is still reason for some benefits of membership in a scholarly society to be exclusive to that society's members. And there is still value created in the editorial work that's done by a publisher or a scholarly society in producing authoritative research records. But like scholars and libraries, societies must begin to grapple with the shifts in value that have been created in and around the internet, recognizing that the locus of the society's value may be, as a result, shifting as well. We must be willing to rethink the role of the scholarly society in the digital age. All of the changes in the profession that I discussed earlier, including the casualization of academic labor and the severe constraints imposed on library budgets, require us to contemplate the possibility that the locus of a society's, if you'll forgive the phrase, value proposition in the process of knowledge creation may be moving from selling access to certain research products to instead facilitating the broadly open distribution of the work that's done by its members. Now this is a profound shift, and not just for societies, but for their members as well. The scholarly society may, in the coming years, operate under a model in which, rather than becoming a member in order to get access to the society's products, one instead becomes a member in order to get one's own work out to the world, surrounded by and associated with the other work done by experts in the field. So the value of joining a scholarly society in the age of open, public, web-based communication then may be in the ability to participate in that communication. So for this reason, at the MLA, we've recently launched MLA Commons, um, which is a platform on which our members can collaborate with one another, participate in group discussions, and share their work openly and freely with the world. We want to work with those members to develop a, a set of new professional practices and standards for this kind of open, publicly accessible communication, including new forms of editing and new forms of peer review. And we're committed to the idea that the role of the society in the years ahead will be to support these new practices, to promote the work that's done by our members, and to help create the broadest possible public understanding of the importance of such work for our collective future. The importance of creating that public understanding cannot be overstated. No less than the future viability of higher education itself requires that we collectively reclaim the intellectual growth fostered in the academy as a public good rather than a private responsibility. But that public good cannot simply be created by being stated. It is our responsibility, all of our responsibility, to make the good public. I hope that you will join us and participate in creating the open future that we all seek. Thank you.